My name is Jessica Fru, and I am the only one in the room who is still in love with my gay ex-husband. So we are here uh, with Jessica Fru, and Jessica, I have a, a question for you before we start. Um, tell me, what's the most common misconception people have about you when you tell them that you're Mormon? <laughs> um, I think the most common misconception is that I, oh man, I'm trying to think how to put it into words, that I, well, that I believe differently than I do. So there's this very, there's an idea that Mormons are very conservative and that we aren't willing to associate with people outside of our religion and that we have a hard time loving and accepting people who live differently than us. Mm. And I feel like that is something that has been a gift I've been given is that I love people and I value the fact that there are people that are different than me. I think that is so important that we aren't the same, that we're all different, that we believe differently because it would be so boring if we all believed the same way I do. Yes. And so I think that's often something people assume when you hear I am Mormon. Yeah. There's, there's like a rigidity that goes with that. Like there's mm -hmm. only certain beliefs, yes. there's only certain things we can subscribe to and that's it. Very black and white. And what you're talking about yeah. is colorful, like your background. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 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 I like to keep things colorful. Yes. If you are listening to us on a podcast app, please check out our YouTube so you can see Jessica's beautiful background. Um, thank you for that, Jessica. I am Laura Cathcart Robbins, and this is the only one in the room, special Sunday edition. But I am never the only one in this room because, as usual, my boyfriend, producer, and co-host, Scott Slaughter, who I call Hun, is here as well. Hi, honey. Hey, honey. So today, like I said, we are talking to Jessica Fru. She hey, is the co-host of the podcast Husband-in-Law, along with her husband and ex-husband. And they share stories of love, marriage, coming out, infidelity, divorce, and co-parenting. Jessica and her ex-husband were married for just over a year when he came to terms with the fact that he was gay. They remain married for another seven years after that. So... This is a really unique story, and we're excited to get into it. I'm, I'm going to start, Jessica, by asking you how you identify. I identify as she, her, as far as my pronouns go. Uh, so, yeah. Okay, great. And is that the... <laughs> I mean, yeah, some people say I know they you always ask. Identify. Uh, that is why I started asking, because I think it's important mm -hmm. for the listeners to know how what, with what pronouns the person who's speaking identifies so they have an accurate picture. Um, I agree. But there's also like some people, like I identify by my race. I identify as a mother. Mm -hmm. um, those are, I identify as someone in recovery. So those are important things yep. I think for people to know about me. And so if I'm asked how I identify, I identify as those things as well. But she, her is great. Yeah, and the next... Mm -hmm. The next thing that came to mind is uh, I'm a bold action taker, which means I take action that feels true to who I am and what I am feeling. So nice. There you go. Nice. Um, all right. So you are living currently in Boise, Idaho, right? Correct. Okay. Um, and so we're, we're going to go back there to Boise, but I want to start um, a few years back when you and your ex-husband, Steve, Right. We're mm -hmm. both members. Can we say his name? I forgot to ask you that. Yes. OK. Yep. Totally fine. <laughs> OK. We can say names. All right. So you and your ex-husband, Steve, were both active members of the Mormon church at once upon a time. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so you found out that Steve was gay about six months into your marriage or you discovered that you thought maybe he was um, Well, you found uh, gay porn on his computer. I. And then you yes. approached him and asked him, was he gay? Can you tell me about that? Yeah. So it was interesting. Steve had um, never allowed himself to think those words. Are you, am I gay? And so the day I found all the porn, he came home from work. He'd been at work and it just like started popping up on the computer. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is 
all gay porn. Like there is no, there's no women here at all. And I was thinking, you know, there's probably a few guys, a handful of guys that enjoy that, that are heterosexual. But I started thinking, this is probably a good chance that my husband is gay. Mm. And what does that mean to me? And how do I process this? And I sat there in our apartment. We were living on the East Coast at the time. And we didn't know anybody there. And so I'm sitting in my apartment just kind of process, processing this all on my own and thinking, oh, my gosh, what do I say to him when he comes home? How do I talk to him about this? I want him to know that it's okay to talk to me about this. Uh, and so I'm going through all this as I'm also crying <laughs> a mm. lot of tears just because, you know, there's so many emotions that are coming up. And he came home and he knew when he saw me, he was like, oh, my gosh. He knew that you had found it. What happened? Yeah, and he's like, what questions do you have? And I said, well, are you gay? Are you, is this, you know, is this a thing? And and he said, no, I'm not gay, I'm not gay. And he told me at the time that he felt growing up, it was better to just look at men because then he wasn't disrespecting women. And so as a child, he had convinced himself and a teen that this was better, it was more respectful, to women, and that's why he was looking at gay porn, not because he was gay. Um, and so I was like, okay. And I knew at that point, I was like, he's he's gay. But he went into a tailspin for a few weeks after that of just, he said, after that point, I, I had to actually think those words. Am I gay? Am I gay? And he mm. said, because I'd been raised in the church and that was never a possibility. That wasn't what my life was supposed to look like. It's not what it should look like. I'd never gone there. I'd never allowed myself to openly think that. And so he um, he didn't come to terms with the fact he was gay at that point. He was still very much in denial. And about a year later, when he was in counseling for some other things, the counselor was like, yeah, these things are an issue, but the real issue is you're gay. And... <laughs> You need to learn and accept that like about yourself. And Steve is like, oh, my gosh. And he didn't tell me right away. He was processing on his own, which is totally fine. And it wasn't until we were getting ready to move to Belize. He was having me return some things to a bookstore. And um, on the receipt, it was like all of these workbooks for people who are gay and Mormon. Mm. And I was like, OK, he has come to terms with this fact. And while I'm at this bookstore, I'm going to go pick up some information for myself so that I can kind of know how to process this as well. And I called him that night and I said, hey, I uh, took the stuff back. <laughs> I noticed on the receipt that it's all like these workbooks because you're homosexual. And he's like, yeah, yeah, I am. And mm. I was like, okay, so how do we proceed? Like, what do we do here? And we both were very happy and content in our marriage. And he was not ready to come out. He was not ready to let go of what he thought his life was going to look like and what he had been taught his life should look like. And we stayed married because we were, we were very happy. And I also knew that I was the type of person, we had the type of relationship that I was okay helping him process this mm -hmm. and to understand himself. I knew myself well enough that I knew I could get what I needed when I needed it. And so we continued forward. We were actually at that point like doing infertility treatments and some things like that. And we stopped them when we moved to Belize, but we still actively were trying to have a kid. So it didn't deter any of that for us. We still wanted to have a child together and to remain married. Uh, and we did have a child together a couple of years later. And um, yeah, wow. it was kind of a crazy thing to realize I so I have a few questions <laughs> and you know yes, at first I was much more interested when you and I talked earlier I was more interested in his journey but now listening to you tell mm -hmm. it I'm like trying to imagine being you were you both raised in the church yes You're, yep we were both born and raised in the church okay and then so yeah would you have were you you don't sound like you were upset when you found it. And I know you said you were crying, but you sounded like, yeah. oh, this is who he is kind of thing. It, mm -hmm. Was it more of just like a reckoning and then you were ready to accept it? Or was it like, oh, my yeah. God, I don't know what I'm going to do? I think there was a mixture of both of those things. I knew 
I didn't make it about me, which I think is really hard for us to do, especially with our partners or spouses, um, to not make things that are going on in our partner's life about ourselves. Yes. And I also always say, I feel that was another gift I was given in that moment uh, and throughout my life is that it wasn't about me. He was gay. <laughs> that wasn't my fault. I had nothing to do with mm. it. And But at the same time, it very much changed the dynamic of my life or what my life might look like or how my marriage would feel by understanding that. And so there was kind of this process of accepting and mourning what I thought I might have or how my life might look. Mm -hmm. And then just understanding and appreciating or loving him and knowing that this didn't change who he was. But instead, I got to know him on a deeper level. I got to see this side of him that nobody else knew or saw and that he was ashamed of Mm. and scared to let other people see. And for me, that felt like a privilege instead of feeling like hurtful. Mm -hmm. And yes, it brought up some issues along the way and there were things that were a struggle. But at the same time, I tried to really focus on the fact that this is hard for him. This is, it's hard for me and I'm allowed to feel those feelings. I'm allowed to feel the hard, but also it's just as hard, if not harder for him. And so I needed to be open to hearing and understanding his feelings and thoughts and emotions around that as well. Yeah. Were you, you mentioned that he was in therapy and his therapist confronted him with just like, but you're gay. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like, yeah, there's all this, but you're gay. Did you, were you in therapy as well? Um, at that time, no. Okay. I I went to therapy. I'm trying to think at what point. I don't think I did in our marriage. I went to his counselor a few times later on in our marriage mm-hmm. after we moved back from Belize um, to the States again. He was back in counseling. And I went with him a couple of times when his counselor invited me. And Steve was like, yeah, come with me. But then I, I didn't do counseling again until I got remarried because then it was like, all of the things with free marriage came up and, and that's a whole nother ball game. Ah, yes. Yes, it is. Yes. So you, you described your marriage with a term I'd never heard before, which was mixed orientation. Um, right. You yeah. were in a mixed orientation marriage and you said that your sex life with your husband was popping. That wasn't your word. That was my word. <laughs> um, I like that word though. I'll take it. But I was really surprised, you know, that so you came to turn. You both came to terms with the fact that he was gay, but you were both legitimately and really still attracted to each other. Can you can you mm-hmm. talk about that? Can you explain it? Yeah, we always called it emotional foreplay. That there's, <laughs> in fact, I think we talked about it with this counselor once. That there's such a deep emotional connection because of where we were at and what we had shared with each other that it led to an intimate relationship and we were very close and we felt so safe and comfortable with each other that allowed us to have a great sex life still and to enjoy each other in all the aspects of marriage. Uh, And which also made me feel like maybe we would make this work. Maybe we would stay married and all of these things. Um, But also I was very aware of the fact we could end up in divorce. I read lots of books Mm -hmm. about mixed orientation marriages when we were, when we were married and was very, realistic about the fact that it might end that it might he might have an affair or he might just decide to go be a hundred percent authentic to who he was and who he is and so I kind of prepped myself for that at the same time but I also had hope that maybe we would make this work um and so we continued forward for quite a while so you carried that hope um because because of that deep connection you guys had together and Mm -hmm. and that was fulfilling enough for each of you for a while yeah and you have a daughter and you're raising her together at that point right yeah yeah Yeah. so we um about five years into our marriage we had a baby girl which was super exciting and uh steve had an affair about two years after that and that is really when the dynamic of our relationship changed. We tried to stay together, but at that point, it was very apparent he wasn't attracted to me anymore. And that's when a lot of the damage was done. And I'm sure that's, I don't know, I've never been cheated on in a heterosexual partnership. Mm -hmm. Um, But I would imagine there's some of those same feelings that you start to realize and feel that 
this person isn't attracted to me anymore and that there's something that's not connecting. And that was very blatant and very hard to accept after the affair. Wow. So how, what did you do to deal with that? Uh, so we, we talked a lot. I mean, he was very honest with me about the fact he wasn't attracted to me anymore. And we tried to get it back. We really tried to figure out, okay, well, we had this mm -hmm. once. How can we make this connection again? And it just kept failing. And he was so torn at that point about what he wanted because he wasn't sure, you know, if he wanted to stay in a marriage with a woman or if he wanted to go be true to himself. And, um, and so it, it was a process of working through that. And we also knew that once we separated, we kind of, he had to kind of come out to people because that's what I was going to ask, well, what happened? Yeah. And we were happy and all of a sudden we're getting divorced. People, <laughs> people were just like, what is going on right. when we actually announced we were getting divorced? Um, and so that was something that I wanted to be sensitive of too. But also he was very respectful of the fact that if we're getting divorced, I needed to be able to explain and have share my story as well. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, wow. we, we fumbled through for a while and then realized it was just not working. We actually got divorced and then dated again. Like <laughs> we were divorced for roughly four months and he's like, I can't do this. I don't know what I want. Mm. I feel so lost. I don't want to lose you. I don't want to be away from Penny all the time. Um, and I'm like, well, now is the time to explore this to see if we can make it work. So we dated for like another six months and it was just a disaster. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but we both came out knowing that we had made the right decision. Mm. That, and he said, he's like, I just don't want to put you through this. You deserve to be loved and to have that affection and to feel and to have somebody who's attracted to you. And he's like, and I don't know if I'll ever be able to give that to you again. Uh, and so we we ultimately decided to. To remain divorced. Wow, I am blown away by your communication and the love that you have for each other and the the understanding and the the honesty. Like that's not something you you hear about in any orientation of marriage very often. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm just really I'm blown away by that and I'm I'm wondering who who in your do people know in your small circle that he was gay and that he was going to leave you to be with someone else or did no one know? So um, his mom knew that he was gay. He told her about a year before we ended up getting divorced. And we had, I think, just one other couple friends that knew that we could talk about it openly. And that was really all we had. He went to some support groups for um, they were religious and for men who were gay in the church. Uh, and so we had, I'd met some of them and could talk to some of them a little bit. One of them became a close friend of mine and a confidant after the divorce, which was really nice to have somebody who knew us before. But for the most part, nobody knew. I remember when we took like a two week separation and I was like, we can't take much longer than this without telling mm. people what's going on. So if you're not ready to tell people, then, then this is about all we've got. And I went and stayed with some friends um, and they, I guess those people knew at that point. I said, hey, can I come back and can I stay with you guys for a couple of weeks? Steve's gay. And they Steve's were like, gay. what? Yeah. <laughs> but I remember calling my parents at the end of that two weeks because we had decided we were getting divorced. I had um, scheduled stuff to move and all of those things. And I called them and I said, hey, uh, Steve's gay. We're getting divorced. I'll be home to Boise in like three days and just like silence mm. on the other end of the phone mm. trying to process this. And same with Steve's family, just very much trying to catch up and figure out what this all meant. And, oh, my gosh, how how did this happen? Um, it was it was interesting. Yeah. Wow. So I'm going to move now to. You got divorced and you remarried um, to your current yes. husband, uh, Matt, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Yeah. Yep. And so did, did you say that Steve works for Matt? Did you tell me that or did I imagine that? No, that's true. Okay. 
Matt owns his own business, and during uh, the pandemic, he had a perfect position for Steve, and Steve was ready to leave his job, and so they started. So Steve now works for Matt, and it's so interesting to me that I'm like, oh man, I hope that they don't get competitive or any of those type of things, and I'm. I am floored that they can both lay their egos aside enough to make it work wow. and enjoy each other. Yes. The, the good part of it is they knew each other so well that they know each other's quirks and all of those weird things the other one does. And so they kind of going into working together, they knew that. And so it made it a little bit easier. But yeah, it was a little scary at first. I'm like, what did we just do? <laughs> did we just like cross this line too far of being friends and getting along? Um, but it's been good. Well, yeah. your your daughter must love it, right? Because she has all of her parents around is it weird for her or do you think she yeah. loves it because I know my kids would love it I think there's moments that it's like oh my gosh there's my dad and my stepdad and my mom all hanging out and making weird <laughs> parent jokes you yeah. know like parents do that embarrass their kids um but I know she loves it she and like the donuts for dad day at school she took matt and steve mm. and it's like walking along with both of them and i know people thought that they were together and it was hilarious and neither of them care neither of them care at all if that's the perspective uh but i think that's so powerful for penny to understand that you know things didn't work but we come together for her yes. and for each other uh steve one day penny was asking him like five years ago she was itty bitty who's your favorite or who's your best friend, dad? Who's your best friend? He said, honestly, Penny, your mom is mm. still my best friend. And Matt is probably her best friend now. And that's good. Mm. That's fine. But she's still the person I go to. And he said, and that's who you want to have kids with is somebody that's your best friend. You want to mm. have a baby and, and create a family with somebody that you love and respect that much. So I think there's moments that's weird, but she also knows that it could be so much harder. She has friends with divorced parents, and she sees how hard that is. And she ultimately, at this point, she knows that she's pretty lucky. Yeah. I mean, to be loved yeah. that way, to, to be around love, even if it is annoying, even if it's embarrassing sometimes. But the like you said, the, the, the other option um, can be so damaging. You know, the mm -hmm. alternative, rather, can be so damaging when, when parents are at odds. So I just think that's a beautiful yeah. thing that you guys are doing. Uh, tell me about your podcast, Husband-in-Law. Yeah, so we've been doing our podcast for a couple of years now. And the three of us record together. It's a little bit different than most podcasts. We don't bring on very many guests. Um, and we start at the beginning of mine and Steve's story and dabble a little bit before then and go through everything we've been through, just sharing our experiences and the things that have helped us, the things that didn't work, just so that other people can get ideas and see how they might be able to have or think differently about their relationships. We also share Matt's story. And on the other side of things, um, we understand that this does not work for everybody. To have a co-parenting relationship like this is not for everybody. We have a very different dynamic with Matt's ex-wife mm -hmm. and have learned how to navigate that and to set boundaries and to show up in the way that is best for the kids in a totally different way. And so we really kind of bring both those perspectives to it of that we want people to figure out what works for them, to not live in that, you know, this is how I was raised, this is how I should live, this is how I should feel, but instead to really embrace what works for them to make it work. Uh, and that's all that matters is that it works for you. It doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. So the gist of our podcast is just sharing our stories and helping other people feel seen and heard and loved and relate to our story in any way that works for them. So I want I want to yeah and 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 but can you just say that again because I think it's really important why you're doing the podcast. Yeah, so our whole goal with the podcast is to help other people think of their relationships in a new way, to start changing how they view them and to find something that works for them. We understand that having the co-parenting relationship Steve and I and Matt have does not work for everybody. Uh, we have a different relationship with Matt's ex-wife and so we it, it, and I want to say it's like complete opposite. Um, but we figured out how to make it work for Matt's kids. Like that's the most important part of that, how to keep the conflict 
away from them, how to keep it so that they feel safe and uh, aren't put in the middle of the relationship. Yeah. And so we really want people to think of how they can make it work and to trust their own intuition and to understand that they're not alone in that and figuring out what works for them. Beautiful, beautiful. And just before we go, I wanted to mention something that you're doing, which I I think I let out a whoop of delight about, which was that you're creating <laughs> coloring books with queer terms. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, for yes. kids and adults probably too, right? Yeah, yeah it's for across the board. Um, and so in the front two pages of the coloring book, it has two pages of just some queer terms. Of course, we do not have all of them in our initial coloring book. Um, there's a lot to encompass, but there's a few there. And then the coloring pages are just different aspects of um, people who identify as queer or being an ally. And it's really just an easy way to start conversations with kids, with yourself. I've had to go <laughs> actually somebody that works for my husband had to go look at the coloring book to look up a term. She's like, I need to know what this term means. And she's like, I hope it's in their coloring book. That's great. And it was. Yeah. And so it's just, and also to help kids or individuals feel normal and seen and to understand that this is normal. I had somebody that reached out. It was a dad and his daughter, I think is nine or 10. And he said, we got your coloring books. And my daughter opens them up and she's reading through the terms and she stopped on the bisexual one and she said, this is me. Oh, this is me, dad. And was all excited and then flipped the page and started coloring her coloring book. And he said he was in tears. Mm. He's like, thank you so much for just making this like a casual thing for her to see herself and identify herself and be able to share that with me and then go on her way as a kid and start coloring. That's incredible. And I thought that was so cool. Yeah that, yeah, that just gave me tears in my eyes. That's beautiful. Um, wow, thank you. Thank you for everything. Tell me where people can find you. Yeah, so you can find us on Instagram at Husband in Law or on any podcasting platform. You can find us at Husband in Law. I suggest starting with episode one. Yeah, that's what I did. to hear the full story. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, continue on through there. And yeah, those are the two best places to meet us. Beautiful. And this will all be in the show notes too. And, and wherever you're getting this podcast, you'll see it in the show notes. And you just click on the link and get to Jessica. Um, Jessica, thank you so much. You're wonderful. What a light you are. And, and oh, what a light you are you. for an entire community of people. I really appreciate what you're doing. Thank you. Thanks for having me.